Black Death to COVID-19, A History of Pandemics. This presentation will discuss the history of healthcare from the Middle Ages through to the 20th century, and then dive down into the details of the differences and similarities between four pandemics, COVID-19, the Black Death and Plague, smallpox and Spanish flu. We will look at some examples of these parts of our history that took place in Decorum and the wider Hertfordshire area. From the Middle Ages through to the 19th century, healthcare was governed by the humoral model of the human body. This model came out of ideas from health practitioners in ancient Greece, the most well-known being Hippocrates. In the UK, doctors still take the modified form of the Hippocratic Oath today. This theory was then refined by Galenus, an ancient Greek physician and monastic scholars later refined it again. It was translated from Greek to Arabic and then European languages. Humoral theory dominated until the 19th century. This is a diagrammatic interpretation of the humoral model. The humoral model has four elements, which you can see in each of the corners of the outside square. That's earth, air, fire and water. Humans have four compatible fluids to the, or humours to these um, elements. Phlegm, blood, yellow bile and black bile. Blood denoted an enthusiastic temperament. Yellow bile an angry and aggressive temperament. Black bile meant that you were depressive and melancholy. And phlegm finally denoted an apathetic, even maybe lazy temperament. The body was considered a fluid vessel and everyone was a unique combination of those humours, but one type usually dominated in an individual. The balance of humours depended on who you are. For example, your age and gender might affect it. Men were believed to be different from women in the humoral sense. So men got the hot humours and women were the phlegm and wet. Illness was considered to be an imbalance of humours. This imbalance could either present from birth or be due to the way that a person lived their life. For example, the food they ate or the lack of fresh air or exercise that they took. Also, illnesses were considered to be individual. For example, a cold would be different cold for each person. The main way to treat this imbalance was to get rid of excess humours. This could be done by various techniques. The picture on the right shows somebody being bled. Also, administering laxatives getting someone to vomit, sweating and urinating were also things that were done. Urine was also a key diagnostic tool. Its colour, quantity, texture and any contents were analysed in great depth by medical practitioners. There were few medical treatments available for illness, but it may surprise you to learn that preventative activity was considered the key to good health. A healthy diet and fresh air and exercise were encouraged. Prayer and music were also used to calm a troubled mind or a quickened pulse. Self-help manuals were very popular, either in written form or orally communicated. The use of religion in the treatment of health complemented the humoral model. Christ was described as a healer in the Bible so people use his imagery to talk about medicine. The Bible also stated that Adam and Eve brought diseases into the world, but that God also brought plants that heal. There was an emphasis that people must pray and repent in order to get better, and that illness was sent as a trial to test their faith and salvation. For example, they thought people would go to heaven or hell, but if they got through a severe illness, it was thought that they would definitely go to heaven. Some diseases, for example plague, were associated with God bringing down punishment en masse. 
It was believed that humans must protect their body to protect their soul. For example, gluttony was considered a major sin. Not everyone believed in humoral theory. There were other theories that developed over time. One was astrological medicine, which believed that each humour linked to the planets, and these with star signs, and these therefore were associated with particular body parts. They cast horoscopes to understand illness. Chemical medicine's main advocate in the early 1500s was Paracelsus, a Swiss physician, alchemist, lay theologian and philosopher of the German Renaissance. Humours were replaced by mercury, sulphur and salt. Later on, Jean-Baptiste von Helmont, working in the late 1500s, was a chemist, physiologist and physician from the Netherlands, and he believed that fermentation, effervescence and putrefaction were the three chemical processes that explained everything that goes on in the body. From the 19th century, medicine and treatments developed in leaps and bounds, and this slide shows the progression of the key factors within that. Amongst the more powerful new developments of the 19th century were anaesthesia in 1846 by William T. G. Morton, and the development of Joseph Lister's antiseptic and aseptic operating theatres in 1865. Effective cures were developed for certain endemic infectious diseases, but the decline in many of the most lethal diseases was due more to improvements in public health and nutrition than to advances in medicine. The two world wars drove speedy development in the first half of the 20th century. Antibiotics were invented in 1929 by Alexander Fleming and used on a large scale from 1940. The smallpox inoculation was the only available immunisation tool from its invention by Edward Jenner in 1796 until Louis Pasteur invented the rabies vaccine in 1885, nearly 100 years. Malaria and AIDS vaccines have still eluded the medical profession and the race is on to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. In the climate of COVID-19, it's interesting to consider the parallels and differences between today and key pandemics from the past. We will be examining similarities and differences in the history of the management of the Black Death of the 1300s and the wider plague, the eradication of smallpox, the Spanish flu of 1918 and today's COVID-19. There are other pandemics that have occurred over time, but the aforementioned are ones we will be looking at more closely. I'm going to start with COVID and then compare it to the Black Death, smallpox and the Spanish flu. So as I said, I'm going to start with the COVID pandemic, even though it's the most recent. This means it'll be a useful baseline when we discuss the similarities and differences between COVID and the Black Death, smallpox and Spanish flu. This map shows us the spread of the virus in March 2020 the darkest shades of red indicate where the most cases were located. So what is COVID-19? Coronavirus disease or COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by newly discovered coronavirus. Coronavirus has reared its head before in the form of SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome in 2003 which started in China and infected 8,000 people worldwide. Older people and those with underlying health conditions are most at risk of a severe or fatal outcome if they catch COVID-19. The COVID-19 virus spreads prim primarily through droplets of saliva or discharge from the nose when an infected person coughs or sneezes. The ease of worldwide travel led to worldwide infections very quickly. The first 34 recorded cases were in Wutan, China on New Year's Eve 2019, and the first fatality was recorded 10 days later. On the 23rd of January, Wutan was locked down, but on the 31st of January 2020, the first case was recorded in Britain.
By the beginning of March, Italy was in lockdown and over 100,000 cases had been reported worldwide. On the 11th of March, the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic. On the 16th of March, the UK went into lockdown and nearly 200,000 cases were reported worldwide. By the 8th of April, which was day 100, over 1.5 million cases and 88,000 deaths were recorded worldwide. In October 2020, 39 million cases and 1.1 million deaths have so far been reported worldwide. To avoid COVID-19, the public were asked to wash their hands, wear masks and keep two metres apart. At the peak of the lockdown, large gatherings were banned, including weddings and funerals. One person only was permitted to do the household shop. Relatives were kept from visiting the sick. Self-isolation or mini quarantines were used when connected with someone who had symptoms. Items in shops and hospitality venues were sterilised. People were even held in ports on cruise ships. At the second wave in the autumn, quarantines were imposed when returning from travel and a local lockdown system was deployed, closely followed by a second national lockdown in November 2020. Also in November 2020, it was announced that a vaccine had been developed that would be rolled out in the UK, starting with medical professionals and care home residents and workers. One of the first pandemics in modern history was the Black Death. This was a form of plague and was one of the deadliest pandemics recorded in human modern history. The Black Death resulted in the deaths of up to 75 to 200 million people in Europe and North Africa, peaking in Europe from 1347 to 1351. It didn't end completely in 1351, but reoccurred as plague several times over the next century. There were two types of plague, bubonic, where the symptoms were lesions or buboes, and pneumatic, which was transmitted through the air. The cause of the Black Death was thought to have started as bubonic initially, but changed to pneumatic once it transferred to Europe. At the time, people didn't understand at all how plague was caused and they believed it to be caused by several different things. Some people thought there were astrological reasons and it was the influence of the heavens and God that had caused it. Some believed in miasma theory, where they thought the plague was caused by bad smells, which then caused infection. Some people thought it was purely punishment by God for their sins, but also racial tensions were brought into play. And for the plague, the Jews were primarily blamed for the Black Death. Even an earthquake in China was thought to have infected the earth. People believed that the plague poison attacked the heart, which was the vital organ of the body, and then extinguished the life spirits. Just to go into a bit more detail about the spread of the plague, the Black Death most likely originated in Central or East Asia. Merchants took it along the Silk Road, which was a network of land and sea trade routes that connected China and the Far East with Europe, and it reached the Crimea by 1347. From there, it was thought to be carried by fleas living on black rats on Genoese merchant ships, spreading through the Mediterranean basin and reaching Africa and Asia. It reached the rest of Europe through Constantinople, Sicily and the Italian peninsula. Current evidence indicates that once it came on shore, the Black Death was spread by human fleas, which caused pneumonic plague, where it was spread by person-to-person -person contact through aerosol infection. This explains the very fast inland spread of the epidemic, which was faster than would have been expected if the primary cause was rat fleas causing bubonic plague. So we've talked about how we try and avoid COVID-19 but there was very little done to prevent the spread of the Black Death during its initial outbreak. There were peculiar things like rubbing onions, 
herbs or a chopped up snake on the boils or cutting up a pigeon and rubbing it over an infected body. Drinking vinegar, eating crushed minerals, arsenic, mercury or even ten-year-old treacle. Sitting close to a fire or even in a sewer to drive out the fever or fumigating the house with herbs to purify the air. Some people called flagellants, who believe God was punishing you for your sins, went on processions whipping themselves. Only a few cities, like Milan and Venice, actually quarantined the sick. After his daughter Joan died of the Black Death in France, Edward III's response was to improve public hygiene, as he believed it was responsible for the epidemic. For example, he stopped the digging of a burial pit for the plague victims in East Smithfield because it was too near the highly populated Tower of London and surrounding residential areas, and the pits were dug further away. In 1349, Edward III wrote to the Mayor of London, directing him to have the streets thoroughly cleansed, for they were, in his words, foul with human faeces and the air of the city poisoned to the great danger of men passing especially in this time of infectious disease. So Edward III actually had the right idea. As I mentioned earlier, the plague didn't stop with the end of the Black Death. In 1563, when plague struck severely again, measures, some of which echo today's Covid ones, were implemented. Blue crosses were attached to doors of houses that held anyone infected with plague over the past week. Inhabitants were to stay indoors for one month after the death or infection of anyone in the building. Only one uninfected person was allowed out of the house in order to buy provisions for the sick, and they were meant to carry a white rod, which, if they forgot, would incur a fine or even imprisonment. By 1580, shipping was heavily monitored and crews and passengers were quarantined either on board their vessels or in the port where they had disembarked. Merchants were kept at East Sussex's port of Rye and were prohibited from entering the city and all goods were to be aired in order not to transport infection. Movement was also monitored within the country. Travellers into London from outside counties were prohibited if there was known to be plague in their area. Bear baiting games, feasts, and festivals were prohibited and beggars were removed from cities. Doctors wore masks and searchers of the dead were employed to determine the cause of death and the dead were collected at night. The picture on the right shows an example of something called a bill of mortality. These have been printed for decades to publicise the cause of deaths in communities but during plague they were minutely studied during to allow people to trace its flow around the country and avoid infected areas. The impact of plague and black death is felt in four main areas. First of all, in terms of population. In total, the plague may have reduced the world's population from an estimated 475 million to 350 million in the 14th century. With the further outbreaks throughout the late Middle Ages, it took until 1500 for the European population to regain the levels that it was in the 1300. Outbreaks of the plague reoccurred at various locations around the world until the early 19th century. Secondly, a financial impact. With such a large population decline from the pandemic, wages increased due to the resultant labour shortages. However, some labourers did suffer a reduction in real incomes owing to rampant inflation. Women specifically found themselves sometimes able to support themselves financially, and some no longer felt the need to marry for financial security. Thirdly, environment. Some historians believe the number of deaths brought on by the pandemic cooled the climate by freeing up land and triggering reforestation. This led to what is known as the Little Ice Age, which you can see in the graph on the right. Finally, the area of discrimination. Renewed religious fervour and fanaticism bloomed in the wake of the Black Death. Some Europeans targeted various groups, such as Jews, friars, 
foreigners, beggars, pilgrims, lepers and Romani, blaming them for the crisis. Lepers and others with skin conditions such as acne or psoriasis were killed throughout Europe. Many believe the epidemic was a punishment by God for their sins and could be relieved by winning God's forgiveness. So how was Hertfordshire and indeed decorum affected by the plague? To escape the plague in London, Edward III fled to the perceived safety of his Hertfordshire palace at King's Langley in January of 1349, bringing with him for protection his personal holy relics, including a fragment of the cross, a vial of the blood of St Thomas a Becket, and certain bones of St George. Whilst there, he formulated his plans for a new chivalric order, the Knights of the Garter. After the Black Death, the King's advisers, seeking a return to the old ways, passed the Statute of Labourers in 1351 to regulate wages and prices at the 1349 pre-Black Death level. In Abbots Langley, Ware and Hartford, the injustice of this led to riots. Such was the labour shortage, landlords soon found that if they wanted men and women to work their land, they had to ignore the new laws and pay higher wages. With the diminished population, farms were abandoned and communities such as Caldicott and Little Gaddesdon, which lost more than half of their population, declined. In a few cases, whole villages were deserted, like Ardwick and Gubblecote, north of Tring, abandoned not because the population was wiped out, but due to economic opportunity of better farmland available elsewhere, and the survivors simply moved on. Ashwell, one of the most valuable manors in Hertfordshire, declined after 1349. Conversely, market towns like Berkhamsted and Baldock grew in importance, and there was an expansion of town fairs to meet the growing demand for goods and a rise in living standards. Queen Elizabeth I lived at Hatfield Palace as a girl. When plague ravaged London, she held parliaments at Hertford Castle in 1564 and 1581. The law courts moved to St Albans for the same reason. One of the most stark and emotional reminders of the plague can be seen in Ashwell. The church there said that the pestilence had been sent by God as a punishment. Desperate parishioners in Ashwell carved their despair into the walls of their church, believing that God had abandoned them. The victims were buried hurriedly and together in a huge pit next to Mill Street which is on your left as you walk from the lich gate to the church door. This area of the churchyard has been left unused and undisturbed over centuries since then, either in fear of unearthing the disease again or out of respect for those who died. The large letters on the wall tell us about when the plague came to the village in 1350 and left the village in 1361 when there were severe gales. It says... 1350. Miserable, wild, distracted. The dregs of the people alone survived to witness. The next pandemic we're going to look at is smallpox. Smallpox is interesting because it's one of the only historic pandemics that has successfully been eradicated. Smallpox is an infectious disease that came in two main forms, variola major and variola minor. The last naturally occurring case was diagnosed in October 1977 and the World Health Organization certified it had been eradicated in 1980. The mortality rate was about 30% with even higher rates amongst babies. Those who survived had extensive scarring of their skin and could be even though blind. Variola major was a severe and more common form of the virus with a more extensive rash and higher fever which could result in confluent smallpox, where the risk of death was high. Variola minor was less common and less severe, with historical death rates of 1% or less. Transmission of smallpox happened by inhaling airborne, oral, nasal or pharyngeal mucus of an infected person. It was transited mainly through prolonged face-to-face -face contact with an infected person, usually within a distance of 1.8 metres. 
but could also be spread through direct contact with bodily fluids or contaminated objects such as bedding or clothing. Smallpox was highly contagious, but spread more slowly and less widely than other viral diseases, because transmission needed close contact, and that after the onset of the rash. The overall rate of infection was also affected by the short duration of the infectious stage of the disease. The number of smallpox infections was highest during winter and spring. During the Middle Ages, several smallpox outbreaks occurred in Europe. However, smallpox had not become established there until the Crusades in the 1400s brought increased mobility and a growth in the population. By the 16th century, smallpox had become a part of life in Europe, where the mortality rate could be as high as 30%. Exploration and colonisation by Europeans spread the disease to other nations, so that by the 16th century, smallpox had become one of the biggest killers throughout much of the world. The earliest procedure used to prevent smallpox was inoculation with the smallpox virus, which likely occurred in India, Africa and China, well before the practice arrived in Europe. This is now known as variolation rather than inoculation, in order to avoid the confusion with the smallpox vaccine. In 1796, Edward Jenner, a doctor in Gloucestershire in England, discovered that immunity to smallpox could be produced by inoculating a person with material from a cowpox lesion. Cowpox is a pox virus in the same family as smallpox variola. Jenner called the material used for inoculation, vaccine, from the root word vaxa, which is Latin for cow. The procedure was much safer than variolation and did not involve a risk of smallpox transmission. The impact of smallpox was widespread. Overall, three in ten people who caught it died, and it continued on in waves until the 20th century. 500 million people died in the last hundred years, and prior to that, in the 18th century, it's estimated that 400,000 people died per year, and that up to a third of those recorded as blind had smallpox as the reason. Prominent families throughout the world often had several people infected by it and sometimes perished of the disease. For example, several relatives of Henry VIII survived the disease but were scarred by it. These include his sister Margaret, his wife Anne of Cleves and his two daughters, Mary I in 1527 and Elizabeth I in 1562. Elizabeth tried to disguise the pop marks with heavy makeup. Mary, Queen of Scots, contracted the disease as a child but had no visible scarring. In Europe, deaths from smallpox often changed dynastic succession. Louis XV succeeded his great grandfather Louis XIV through a series of deaths and smallpox or measles among those higher in the succession. He himself died of the disease in 1774. In Russia, Peter II died of the disease at 14 years old, and prior to becoming emperor, Peter III caught the virus and was left scarred and disfigured. His wife, Catherine the Great, was spared, but fear of the virus had a serious effect on her. She feared for the safety of her son Paul so much that she made sure that large crowds were kept at bay and sought to isolate him. Eventually, she decided to have herself inoculated by a British doctor, Thomas Dimsdale. While this was considered a controversial method at the time, Paul was later inoculated as well. Catherine then sought to have inoculations throughout her empire, saying, My objective was, through my example, to save from death the multitude of my subjects, who, not knowing the value of this technique and frightened of it, were left in danger. By 1800, approximately 2 million inoculations were administered in the Russian Empire. Joseph Stalin fell ill with smallpox at the age of seven. His face was badly scarred by the disease. He later had photographs retouched to make his pockmark less apparent. There were a couple of people in Hertfordshire 
who were very important in the treatment of smallpox. The first was Hertford physician Sir Thomas Dimsdale, who I mentioned earlier, who travelled across Europe to Russia in 1768, where he earned the undying gratitude of the Empress Catherine II by inoculating her son, the Grand Duke Paul, and other members of her family. She made him a baron of the Russian Empire and awarded him £12,000 and a pension of £500 per annum for life. He was also presented with diamond-encrusted portraits of herself and her son, and was made a royal councillor. In all, he was paid today's equivalent of £10 million for his work in Russia. Back at home, he set up an inoculation house in Bide Street, Hartford, and was the author of several books on smallpox. Hartford was a popular place for smallpox inoculators. The first British-born person to be inoculated against smallpox was a child called Edward Montague. The doctor who supervised this was Scottish surgeon Sir Charles Maitland. Later he retired to Hartford and in 1721 was called out to variolate three-year-old Mary Montague, Edward's sister, by her mother Lady Mary Montague. The variolation was successful and Mary grew up to be the wife of Prime Minister Lord Bute. The final pandemic we're going to talk about in this presentation was the Spanish flu, also known as the 1918 flu pandemic. It was an unusually deadly influenza pandemic caused by the H1N1 influenza A virus. Lasting from February 1918 to April 1920, it infected 500 million people, about a third of the world's population at the time, and came in four successive waves. The death toll is estimated to have been somewhere between 17 and 50 million, and possibly as high as 100 million, making it one of the worst pandemics in human history. It was called the Spanish flu, not because it started in Spain, but because most countries were under censorship due to the war, the First World War. But Spain was neutral, and so was not under any censorship, and it publicised the disease. It was also called the Forgotten Pandemic because its spread was overshadowed by the deadliness of World War I and covered up by news blackouts and poor record keeping. So how did Spanish flu spread? It had the same seasonal pattern as Covid seems to be having. The outbreak started in March 1918 and came back with a much bigger wave in September. It was lower in the new year and finished with a mild outbreak in the following May. It got to China, finally, in June. The 1918 outbreak started in America and was spread initially to Europe and then the rest of the world by soldiers at the end of the First World War. The Spanish flu affected young people rather than old, and infection could be fatal in this age group due to what's known as a cytokine storm or an overreaction of the body's immune system, which is much like the way COVID-19 works. Unlike COVID, however, it attacked the stronger immune systems. By the summer of 1919, the flu pandemic came to an end, as those that were infected either died or developed immunity. I'm going to start by talking about how people try to avoid catching Spanish flu. Um, by talking about how they did it in America initially, because that's where the outbreak started. American states approached the spread and the disease in different ways. Philadelphia went forward with a Liberty Loan parade attended by tens of thousands of Philadelphians, spreading the disease like wildfire. In just 10 days, over a thousand Philadelphians were dead and another 200,000 sick. However, St. Louis in Missouri was different. Schools and cinemas closed and public gatherings were banned. Consequently, the peak mortality rate in St. Louis was just one eighth of Philadelphia's death rate. In other cities, they went to great lengths to try and avoid it. In San Francisco, for example, some serious law court trials were held outdoors in parks so that people could be out in the fresh air. In Britain, the flu was played down initially. Sir 
Arthur Newsom for the Royal Society of Medicine advised people to stay at home if they were sick and to avoid large gatherings, but his memorandum was buried by the government. Streets in some towns and cities were sprayed with disinfectant and some people wore anti-germ masks as they went about their daily lives. In some factories, no smoking rules were relaxed in the belief that cigarettes would help prevent infection. The impact of Spanish flu was very severe. In the US, up to 200 in every 1,000 people infected died, which was about 3% of the total population. And in the UK, 250,000 people died. There were some experimental vaccines developed, but none prevented the viral infection. Spanish flu infected an estimated 500 million people, about a third of the world's population, and killed an estimated 50 million, more than the death toll for the First World War. In just one year, 1918, the average life expectancy in America plummeted by a dozen years. Hospitals in some areas were so overloaded with flu patients that schools, private homes and other buildings had to be converted into makeshift hospitals, some of which were staffed by medical students. Officials in some communities imposed quarantines, ordered citizens to wear masks and shut down public places, including schools, churches and theatres. People were advised to avoid shaking hands and to stay indoors and libraries put a halt on lending books, and regulations were passed banning spitting. Funeral parlours were overwhelmed and bodies piled up. Many people had to dig graves for their own family members. The flu was also detrimental to the economy in the United States. Businesses were forced to shut down because so many employees were sick. Basic services such as mail delivery and rubbish collection were hindered due to flu-stricken workers. In some places, there weren't enough farm workers to harvest crops. Even state and local health departments closed for business, hampering efforts to chronicle the spread of the 1918 flu and provide the public with information about it. Interestingly, the poster on the right indicates that similarly to today's COVID outbreak, new technology, like in those days the telephone, came into its own to unite people who were isolated. Spanish flu had some direct impacts, specifically in decorum. The Beaches, pictured on the left, is a large house on King's Road in Berkhamsted. During World War I, it was used as a hospital by the Voluntary Aid Detachment, a voluntary unit of civilians who provided nursing care for military personnel. It was known as the Detention Hospital. Nursing sister Hannah Maud Cottingham, pictured in the middle, was matron here during World War I. Originally from Downpatrick in Northern Ireland, Sister Cottingham died of influenza in 1918 during the Spanish flu epidemic. At the time, the Inns of Court had a large army training camp in Berkhamsted. Affected by the death of a young woman who died far from home in the service of her country, the trainee officers paid for her memorial in Rectory Lane Cemetery. In the early 1970s, British historian and journalist Richard Collier placed adverts in newspapers asking for memories of the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. He used the letters to write his book, The Plague of the Spanish Lady, pictured on the right, which was published in 1974. The original letters are now held in the archive at the Imperial War Museum. One of the selection of letters is a moving letter from Elsie Phillips Cole, from Tring, who wrote in 1973. My husband was in France. I had three children under four years, boys. I remember one night in particular. I slept between the cots of my two eldest, and we all had high temperatures from flu, but I was nursing my baby just the same. There was no time to wean him. The boys were restless and tossed and muttered, but the baby slept on, unusually till I was dressed, and when I took him from his cot, he was practically unconscious and limp. I had read in the Daily Mail that the French treated the flu successfully by taking nothing but brandy for three days. By the grace of God, I had brandy left, and I began to wet the baby's lips with it, and got a little down him until he became fully conscious. I looked out of the window for help, 
and saw the empty car of the one doctor left in Tring. I raced downstairs and got in his car till he came out of his client's house and got him to see my baby, and in no time he had the very efficient district nurse in to help me. My daily help had not been able to come, as her brother was on leave from France and he was down with the flu. And my sister and parents, who lived nearby also, they had it, and their staff did. There were isolated cottages where all the inhabitants lay dead and unattended, three to be exact, close to Tring. And the national school was turned into a hospital, but with three trained nurses in charge. But the three nurses caught it. One died, and two ended up in a mental home. My aunt volunteered, but gave up when she had it. Another local person who helped in the fight against Spanish flu died of the disease himself. Frederick Charles Fisher, who was born in 1858, was initially educated at King's College School and at St George's Hospital, where he was a ophthalmic and orthopaedic assistant and house surgeon. He then worked in King's Langley from 1881. He was for many years surgeon to the West Hearts Hospital, medical officer and public vaccinator to the King's Langley District of the Hemel Hempstead Union and public vaccinator to the Abbots Langley District of the Watford Union. He was at one time a member of the West Hearts Medical Society. Fisher died of Spanish flu on November the 6th, 1918 and was buried at King's Langley. Decorum and the wider Hertfordshire area have had their share of impact from and influence on the historic pandemics of the Black Death, Plague, Smallpox and Spanish Flu. Now that a vaccine has been developed, it remains to be seen what the ultimate impact of COVID-19 will be, both medically and economically. <laughs>